be, uh, for being here for the celebration of service, our weekly uh, get together. And I uh, want to thank Natalie for greeting everybody. And then uh, also a roundabout reporter, Lon Barker, uh, for captaining the meeting uh, uh, for the roundabout. I uh, want to invite Phil S. you up for our pledge, reflection, and introduction of guests. So, Phil. <coughs> Please join me in the pledge. <coughs> Please sit down. I have this. It's something I want you to watch.
I wanted to do that because uh, tomorrow uh, completes 38 years of being a Rotarian, and it completes 38 years of perfect attendance. I started as a Rotarian, and the veterinary friend of mine said, whatever you do, don't try and get perfect attendance. <laughs> and I thought as an OBGYN, I thought, you know, if I start missing, it's going to be real easy to just pass. So I kept going. I ran into a friend of mine, his name was Dr. Ed Banner from the Mayo Clinic at a American College of OBGYN uh, annual convention. He saw my rotary pin and he said, hey, I got something for you. So I see you're a Rotarian. He says, right here. He says, I've got, I had 20 years perfect attendance. I want you to shoot for 20 years perfect attendance. So I'm still going. I don't know how long it'll last, but uh, I enjoy it. But the thing that I wanted to say, and I've talked to Jim Bright about this, as you know, when you have perfect attendance, you make up at a lot of clubs. And I've told you I've spoken at probably 100 clubs. The one thing that the Bloomington Rotary Club does that is different from almost every other club that I go to is that you pause one nation under God. There's no comma there. It should be one nation under God, comma. So I don't know, you can think about that and maybe next week when you start to uh, recite the pledge, you'll remember that. I still have my certificate that I got for one year of perfect attendance. <laughs> I got another one here at 22 and then they quit caring about attendance. <laughs> so I never got any more of them, but uh, it's in my heart. Um, I'd like to now uh, move to the um, guests that we have. When I call your name, would you please stand? It's Kara Rogers, a guest of Art Omic. Kara, where, there you are. All right, we've got four of them here, so hang on. We've got uh, Karen Feidel, Al Feidel, and then we have Aaron Feidel, who's 11, and Danny Feidel, who was eight. Do you all please stand back there? There you go. Uh, Sam Vidic, a guest of Trent Deckard. Say it again. UDAC. I'm sorry, it is a U. I thought it was a V, so I apologize. We have Alice Zalman and Michelle Hartman from Hilliard Lions and their guests of Lauren. I had, an, I had an uncle, Adolf Zalman. Andrew Lambert, guest of Michael Sherman. If any of you are interested in joining Rotary, it's a great club to belong to and give back to your community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. Um, birthdays this week, we have uh, John Bender, uh, membership anniversaries, Don Colglazer. I have you down as three years here and 13 years elsewhere, Don. Does that sound wrong? Wrong, right? Uh, but uh, congratulations on your anniversary. And then also Lance Everly. Lance, 17 years. So congratulations on your uh, membership anniversaries. All right, some quick pre-program announcements. Don't forget the uh, district conference is uh, April 27th in Clarksville, and we still have the availability of that district uh, engagement grant that we can get uh, a list of all the people who plan to attend district conference, and we can get some uh, additional matching dollars from the district for that. Um, the child and maternal health uh, forum that we're looking to have and partner with on the other with the other two clubs in the city we're going to be uh, titling it it takes a village a resource fair for parents infants and to toddlers and that will take place on May 18th at the warehouse from 12 to 4 so May 18th uh, is that child and maternal health uh, fair that we're going to be having our third quarter lunch buddies are now available Natalie I believe has a hard copy back there if you want to check that out uh, and we'll also be emailing out a copy uh, of that as well. So pretty simple. Go grab coffee, grab lunch, grab a beverage, an evening beverage, or just get together with your lunch buddy. Let Natalie know 
Hopefully you get to know uh, somebody that you didn't know. Maybe you just make up with a friend that you've known for a long time. Uh, and you'll get to make up uh, and help work towards your 38 years of perfect attendance. Uh, we have a board meeting this Thursday. Um, so if you uh, want to join or have something you'd like to bring to the board's attention, um, we also need greeters, reflectors, and introducers. So please go to Sign Up Genius, or you can just let Natalie know if you have one or the other you would like to do for January or any time in February. Uh, just let us know, and we'd love to add you. And then uh, the program committee will be meeting uh, on, after next week's meeting immediately following. Uh, so Jim and Michael will be leading that up. Deep breath. Whew. I'll shut up now. And Susie, want to do happy dollars. Where's Susie? Happy dollars. Anybody have any? Yeah. Liz has got some back there. Yeah, so the grandson is helping pass out brochures today about United Way annual program or free security tax service. We have a whole, we have bags of them here. If you'd like to take them back to where you work or pass them along to others, uh, we appreciate it very much. I also have uh, posters that we go on bulletin boards. These are also go on bulletin boards. Mm -hmm. the, the program begins at the end of the month. We appreciate all the programs we can to get up. Anybody else? Lynn. see our friends from CATS back here today. Uh, I think it was about 10 years ago, uh, John Diltz and I were at a district conference in Evansville, and uh, the local version of CATS in Evansville was there to cover the district conference. And I said, this is pretty cool, and I said, I wonder if Bloomington CATS will do it for us. And 10 years later, uh, it's always a treat to see them here. By the way, their telecast of our meetings appears on Comcast, I understand. Uh, and they were also there. The footage you saw at the last meeting of our uh, gala with uh, RI President Amy Risley was captured by the CATS team. So show the appreciation for the CATS Not many clubs have that sort of a resource, so we're certainly appreciative of having you. Yeah, Jim. Susie, you're getting your work out today. <laughs> Back and forth. I have a happy dollar for Sunday's results as Rotary continues to make an effort to take over the county council. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, is that three now we got? Yeah. Jim, Jeff, and Trent, right? Any other happy dollars? And Shelly, yeah, that's right. All right, well, Jim, yeah. City council, I'm sorry, you're right. After they take over the <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, Susie. All right, uh, now I want to invite. Well, yeah. <laughs> All right, any more? Okay. All right, now I want to invite uh, Mr. Michael Shermis up to introduce our speaker for the day. Michael. Thanks, Lauren. So uh, the formal bio first. Um, Dave Williams grew up in Bloomington and attended IU, earning bachelor's and master's, uh, master's degrees in rec uh, recreation. He worked 16 years for the Indiana State Park System, serving as a assistant uh, property manager at Turkey Run State Park, property manager at Indiana Dune State Park, rehabilitation specialist, and assistant director, too. For the last 25 years, Dave has served as operations director for the City of Bloomington Parks and Recreation Department. He also serves as the project manager for Switchyard Park, a $30 million facility that is scheduled to open in late 2019 and is the topic for his presentation today. Then the not so formal on Dave, Dave sits about 75 feet away from me at the, the city of Bloomington and in my years there, I've always been struck by his very agreeable nature. I got to test that recently when, he did some, uh, when we did some horse trading. So I wanted to put some adaptive cycles on the beeline, which he was agreeable to, but he quickly asked if I could do a bit of research on wheelchairs for a splash pad in the new Switchyard Park so it would be more truly accessible. I quickly did. Now that's the kind of colleague I enjoy working with. Without further ado, Dave Williams. Well, 
Thank you, and thank you for having me. I see a lot of familiar faces, and as Michael indicated, I'm the classic Bloomington townie, as is my wife, the former Kim Walters. Uh, as is often the case, and I've shared this with my son and daughter-in-law, mm -hmm. if you uh, grow up here, you go to school here, then you can't wait to leave here. And then eight years later, we couldn't wait to get back. And I shared that with my son. He says, now, Dad, Indianapolis is where we want to be a little bit bigger community. It took them about six years in there firmly in planning and building a house in Bloomington. So happy to be here, happy to share with you today's topic, uh, Switchyard Park. Uh, this is a transformational project for the community and is certainly the biggest the biggest project that I've ever been involved with in my 25 years in Bloomington. Um, this is an aerial view. If you were perched on a crane, maybe at Bender or Black Lumber on Henderson Street, you would be high atop this property. So give you a little orientation as we go through the slides for what's coming with Switchyard Park. Rogers Street is the western boundary with the main entrance. This is the B-Line Trail that I'm sure many of you have uh, utilized over the years, a former rail corridor. Walnut Street has an entrance. We were approached by the owners of the Wee Willie's restaurant, and they were willing sellers uh, when that uh, business closed. And this goes not all the way to Country Club. There is still property that is owned by the CSX Railroad that we did not acquire. But I wanted to walk you through the design, but it's important to know a little bit of the historic context regarding this property. My dad worked his entire career for RCA. We moved here in 61, and back in the 50s and 60s and 70s, and even into the 80s, Bloomington was a manufacturing hub, and you think of all the long now gone factories of Westinghouse and Otis and, and RCA, my mom, uh, my dad's passed away, but my mom can't get over that there's not even the physical sign of the RCA factory in Bloomington, which was literally the lifeblood. Mm -hmm. But the switchyard um, came the, in the early 1900s, but this is from 1949. Actually, you would have thought following the war years that perhaps there had been a buildup of activity, but it really surged in the 70s, the mid-70s, and then slowly but surely manufacturing decided uh, started to decline and the customers for the railroad simply were declining as well. So our first opportunity to buy property declared by surplus by the railroad was the Beeline Trail, which if you think about the opportunity that could have been lost had we not been able to strike a deal with CSX, you're literally talking about an urban sidewalk right through the core of our downtown community that I'm sure you're familiar with many communities that did not acquire old abandoned corridors and you literally have a strip of no man's land between two property owners on either side. So that kind of set the stage for our relationships uh, with CSX, but this is the, I heard a meeting announcement for the warehouse, that's the very large 200,000 square foot facility on South Rogers Street and a property, uh, a, another warehouse. These are all remnants of the RCA days so Grimes Lane would be up here. So the Switch Art Park encompasses this property. A lot of it is floodplain. It's a challenging piece of property that I'll get into as well. So here's our timeline. <clears throat> and we're government, so you can see that from the time we acquired the rail corridor to Switch Art Park's about 20 years. We've also discovered that the only entity that has the more attorneys than government is the railroad. So it's taken us a a lot of negotiation, a lot of uh, work, and securing some funding through the state as well. Um, but the railroad has been, or was, in Bloomington for 150 years. And it was the lifeblood of this part of the community. And that's where we're hoping this park can inject a little bit of a transfusion and some excitement and some economic development. But we uh, acquired the property during the Cruzan administration, completed a master plan, then we kind of stepped back for a few years. And Mayor Hamilton has, has uh, certainly been the, uh, the cheerleader for this property and a lot of other park improvement projects that are going on right now. We are in construction, Weddell Brothers. We're happy to say that it's the hometown contractor that is building this uh, park. And we started in May and we will have a park worthy of a ribbon cutting in November of this year, come hell or high water. 
And we'll final completion will be tree planting, uh, punch list, things of that nature in May of 2020. Well, I think this is very interesting, and, and many of you uh, may recall the days where getting across any of the uh, crossings of the, the CSX Railroad was uh, quite an event, particularly down at Country Club. So back in the day, this was uh, what the railroad switch art looked like. In its heyday, 700 rail cars could be stored in the switch art on a turntable arrangement and literally think of your old record player where you could swivel the locomotive to one side, hook up a line of trains, and then aim them out of town because there was only one route to the north out of town. But it was a very vibrant, very busy, hectic area. I've talked to a lot of the old timers that worked in the railroad, many of them their entire working career. Um, so they're happy to see this property preserved for public use. So if you can recall the B line, we started by way of working with the railroad to remove the tracks and ties, and there's literally nothing left railroad related on this property. They removed everything except the Grimes Lane building that I'll talk about in just a second. But today's B line is certainly one of the most popular trails in a, in a community park system that is very trail centric. Um, working with Jeff and the county to talk about some trail development. In my 40 plus years of public service in the parks profession, I can tell you that there is really nothing more popular than trails. People love trails. They're cheap, not to build, but to use. You don't have to have a lot of specialized equipment except for a good pair of walking shoes. The number of people that have found healthness, health and wellness and fitness by way of trails, either competitive runs or recreational walks, as well as this becoming an urban sidewalk through the heart of our community, has certainly been one of the more successful projects that we've had in our park system. So the Switchyard Park, uh, I had a conversation before I, I, I ate about, boy, what's that black soil? Is that rich farm soil? It is not rich farm soil. There are some environmental challenges with this property, and the biggest one is coal ash, which was a byproduct of locomotive, locomotive combustion. It was used as a fill material. It is wall to wall in this 50-odd acre property. It is to depths of four to six feet. The city of Bloomington, when it acquired the Beeline Trail, decided, and I think it befits the reputation Bloomington has for environmental protection, is to seek an environmental covenant with the state. So I remember going to the Indiana Department of Environmental Management saying, okay, we acquired this rail corridor, we know it has coal ash and cinders, how do we make a trail out of them? They go, huh? And it, it came to understand that no one in the municipal parks departments throughout the state had come to the state asking that. But to their credit, along with a covenant, which is a little bit of a burden, but I think it protects the public and the public use of this property, they gave us some money to clean up the, uh, the contamination. This is not glow-in-the-dark stuff. You either have to ingest coal ash, you have to pump it from groundwater, which we will not, or you have to be very mindful of the dust, so our contractors are constantly reminded to wear dust masks. The remediation prescription for this property is that if we have tested environmental areas of the property with coal ash and the levels of arsenic and lead are high, we will excavate and remove. But our responsibility is to keep our contamination in our backyard. So we've worked literally for three years with the Department of Environmental Ma Management for a remediation plan that calls for selective removal, where it is landfilled at special waste landfills. But the biggest prescription is cover. So when you sit out on the concert lawns of Switchyard Park, you'll be sitting on 18 inches of clean soil. That protects you from what lies underneath. If you're running down the Beeline Trail, you have an asphalt cap that you're running on top of coal ash. So you encapsulate it, you cover it, you try to manage it that way, and I think we've uh, achieved those requirements through the state for this property. The property is mostly floodplain. That prohibits buildings, as it would for you, a private citizen wanting to build an ho a home in a floodplain. Parks departments have some leeway for the types of facilities that we have because they're typically not inhabited, but we had a challenge with that property as well. One of the most 
pressing issues that I heard during the master plan, well, you know, this is just going to be a park for homeless people. And it's no uh, mystery to you folks that we are challenged in some of our properties with managing the homeless community uh, in Bloomington. Um, I'm going to get into some of the details as to why we think this park will be for everyone and how, from my experience, what it takes to make a successful park. Funding we received from tax increment financing where the incremental increase in a property's assessed value goes towards a designated pot of money to retire the debt to make improvements. And it can be a park, it can be sanitary sewer, water lines, things of that nature. Uh, we were able to secure substantial funding for this park through the TIF funding requirement. Bidding environment, it was interesting. We all thought, boy, wouldn't it have been great had we bid this project during the tail end of the recession where contractors were literally trying to stay in business by getting a project and prices were extraordinarily low. We were concerned about the competitive environment when we bid Switch Art Park and it came to pass. We had two bidders, only two bidders. We could not attract Indianapolis firms to come down because they were tied up in a very, uh, very volatile bidding environment but also a very busy one. So we're happy again to get uh, Weddell Brothers Construction to help be our general contractor. Quick, fast, and furious overview, and then I'll get into a deeper dive. Grimes Lane to the north, a series of athletic court facilities and parking, some event lawns, a daylighted stream. This is one of the things that Parks is trying to do, a lot of communities are trying to do, where you have a natural resource that's underground and you want to bring it to the surface, make it an amenity, make it an aesthetic feature. So we are opening up a historic culvert through the center of the park that discharges into Clear Creek. Concert lawns, we've outgrown our concert venues at Third Street Park and O'Brien Park. We just have too many people coming, too many people uh, getting parked in their driveway across the street when they're attending a concert at Bryan Park. So there's about six acres of concert lawn here and a, and a large stage. We worked with the Bloomington Symphony or Orchestra and said, okay, when all of you come, including the cello player and the tuba player, how many people and how much space do we need? So we use that as a, as a benchmark for our facility. I've been in this profession a long time. I, there's a couple things I never thought I'd see, but they've become standard equipment. One is a dog park and the other is a dog drinking fountain. Uh, I never thought, you know, and I've actually unfortunately seen children kneel down on the dog <laughs> and, and drink out of it, that happens, but in my business, people come where people are. If you go to Cascades Park and you don't see another soul around you, even though it is approaching its hundredth year with mature trees and a creek and beautiful cliffs and canyons, if you don't see people in the park, you're probably going to keep driving, unless you really want some solitude. In municipal parks, you've got to bring people into the facility. You have to inhabit the, the property with a lot of different activities that attract a lot of people. And I think that's what we're trying to do with this park. This is the main event. If you think about train travel, and it's an interesting discussion about trains, we had a lot of people a little older than I, saying, well, you need to make this a train museum. You need a caboose, and we can get you one. You need a locomotive, and we can get you one. And we're going, well, yeah, I've ridden on a train. I remember as a child riding on a train, the inner urban trains train out west. But a lot of folks, certainly my kids, don't have an affinity for train travel. So it was a bit of a hard sell. We're going to pay homage to the railroad, the railroad's history in Bloomington. Where if you've been on the trail, the Beeline Trail, you'll see the signage, kind of historic signage throughout the three miles. It tells a story with pictures of, uh, many of you may not know, that the uh, Bloomington Convention Center was once a Ford factory assembly plant. So we try to acknowledge the history, but it, evoking the term, the platform, and when you went up to board the passenger train, you went up to the platform. This is the money spot. This is the platform. So. Parking coming off of Rogers Street, we're into pervious pavements. If you've ever been into several of our parking lots, we try to be environmentally conscious, allow the water to drain through filtered stone and fabric so we don't have to encumber the property with a lot of retention ponds, which can be drowning hazards and not very aesthetic to look at. But this is the flagship facility, about an 11,000 foot, square foot pavilion 
that will offer indoor, outdoor space, garage doors, as well as climate controlled space of about 7,500 square feet. And this is illustrated with pop-up tents in a very much a festival atmosphere, uh, areas where people can congregate another performance venue there as well. So the bee line runs through this. You're thinking, oh, geez, this is going to be like the farmer's market on a Saturday if I'm a bee line runner or bicyclist. Yeah, if you don't want to go through it, we'll have a bypass trail that will go along Clear Creek for the entire length of the park. So if you don't want to encounter people through this area, you can just go around through here down to the south end and rejoin the Beeline Trail. Um, we are in going to have a splash pad, a spray plaza, a water playground. Everyone understand those terms. A lot of communities who, like us, have circa late 50s, early 1960s swimming pools are realizing that the day is going to come where they're going to have to rebuild them. You can't put concrete underwater for 50 years and expect not to have some damage. The big trend in this area is water recreation where everybody gets wet, but no one has to know how to swim. So you, you literally can come in your swimming suit. We'll have a changing facility here. Or you can just run through it. It has vertical jets that will pulsate, have electric lights and choreographed uh, pulsations. But in the wintertime or the off season, we can use it as festival space. We think this is going to be a hit for people that just want to get wet or the grandparents that don't want to go swimming at Bryan Pool, but just love to have their grandkids alongside with them. So we think that'll be a fun facility. Uh, there'll be a shelter house facility here, our biggest, most accessible playground to the south. And let's see, what else? This, that pretty much covers that area. Now, right now in design of parks, or historically, if you use one of our facilities, basically say, here's your park bench. Here's where you sit. Here's your table. Here's where you sit. Or you sit on the ground. Well, the progressive design schemes, and they make a lot of sense, is to offer creature comforts this is, happens to be the playground, but we have a lot of very interesting seating. Why? You may not want to play bocce ball, but you've always been intrigued by it, and you want a comfortable place to sit to watch a match. Or pickleball. You've heard about it, have no idea how to play it. You want to view it from a safe distance. We are trying to look a lot at creature comforts. This will be our first park with movable tables and chairs. Why? Because I want this group to have a lunch meeting in Switchart Park someday. I want you to come to the park not because you want to play basketball, but because it's a good venue for you to have your lunch meeting. We'll have Wi-Fi in this park, something we have never offered anywhere else in our community. So we're trying to make the creature comforts, the, 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 the reasons why you might come to this park as a social civic gathering place as well as recreation. We're trying to cover all the bases. So uh, back to the comment about homelessness. This is the remnant, very nondescript, one-story railroad building. It was for years a maintenance facility for a very short period of time, was a passenger station. That will be the Bloomington Police Department substation. They will have a physical presence on this park. We think that will help uh, displace a lot of the ne'er-do-wells that want to come in and uh, do things that are unacceptable in the park. Running south, pickleball. If you haven't catched the, tra uh, the craze, be ready. If you're a tennis player like I am with no knees, you can put two pickleball courts in a tennis court and you don't have to do as much running. Bocce ball court, a, a huge number of people, including a lot of international students from IU, advocated for it. We have those, basketball, fitness stations, community gardens, and to the south is a second skate park. And going, geez, you know, I, isn't Kirkwood a skate park? Well, it's really not. This was one of the biggest vote getters of the constituencies that we've worked with, and they happen to be one of the most responsible facility users that we have. Here's some other facts and figures, including our land acquisition, our consulting, our contract costs. We're about $34 million. We'll be paying it off in a TIF bond. We hope to have everything ready to go by the end of this year. Uh, I talked about the daylighting. Our buildings will be LEED certified. 
And we're also evaluating our operational costs. Where do we have excess capacity in our parks department? Well, many of you may have been softball players 20 years ago, probably not now. Everything has a life cycle. Softball is on the decline. Golf is hanging, but steadily dropping a little bit. We're looking at reallocating our resources. So we do not borrow our resources for the maintenance of Bryan Park or Alcott Park or Cascades Park to maintain this facility. So this is the end shot. Uh, the concert lawns are here. The bypass trail along Clear Creek to the south. The dog park here. So if you have big dog, little dog, you're more than welcome. We want you to come to this park. Your use, your participation, your interest, for whatever reason you come to a public property is what will make this park a successful venture for the city of Bloomington. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. You mentioned uh, two challenges. One, the remediation of the coal ash. Uh, was there any other remediation you had to do? I know in a rail yard there was spillage over 100 years, of, uh, and you had people like GE and, and RCA who worked with PCBs and other things. Yeah. Was that a challenge? There, there was a fueling station, and by historic photos we were able to, to pinpoint the exact location. Mm -hmm. uh, ironically, there was not a lot of leakage. There was some ground contamination that was excavated and removed. PCBs we have sampled throughout, not only in the creek, but also, as I mentioned, the daylighted stream where we took out a culvert and opened it up. We tested those well below action limits, so that was a, a relief. <clears throat> now this morning, uh, one of the excavators doing a bridge found a bone. Uh, oh boy, here we go, we found Jimmy Hoffa. But, um, the police department checked it out, it was a horse or cow bone. So, you know, digging deep in, in a property that was used by one industry for 150 years, you hope you don't find anything you're not expecting, and so far, so good. Yeah, the other, uh, yes. my question was on, on challenges. Um, I've, I've worked with FEMA in the past on municipalities that had uh, flood zones, and uh, some of the restrictions they had to deal with were onerous. Um, I know as a flood zone, they limit the, the flood um, chance after construction to 0% mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, increase mm -hmm. in flood chance. Uh, did, did that offer any uh, terrific challenges for you? In, no, in one of the things that we did proactively before we started the design, we petitioned FEMA to narrow the floodplain. For not only, less so for park purposes, because most of the park except the Rogers Street platform area is in the floodplain, but to also open up some economic development opportunities. So for example, the North Warehouse that uh, has Storage Express on its northern border, there's two property owners, that building was entirely in the floodplain before the letter of map revision was petitioned. Now it's entirely out of the floodplain. So the city has a, a strong interest in adjoining properties being redeveloped, and many of those properties look like they did back in the RCA days. Um, so we made the move with the LOMAR uh, to narrow the floodplain, and I think that's going to help accelerate some development in the area. Hi, Lynn. Good. You mentioned the, flood, the, the splash park. Yeah. I wonder if you could speak about how heavily Brian Park Pool is used or class is full. Or, I am concerned that this new generation children are not learning how to swim because there's splash pads everywhere. Mm -hmm. And our planet is largely water. And mm -hmm. I grew up in a coastal state. Learning to swim is pretty fundamental. So mm -hmm. that's my concern. Mm -hmm. Is Brian Park already at capacity? Classes and are there opportunities for people to swim? Oh, there. Yeah, the question is, uh, is with regard to the splash pad, is, is this kind of going to lead to, to youngsters not learning how to swim? Kind of a life skill, I think all of us would acknowledge. And does Brian Pool have the capacity to continue to offer um, classes in learning how to swim, life saving, and things like that? The answer to that is yes, we continue to do that. Now, Brian Pool someday. Uh, my God, I got my picture in the paper diving 
into Brian Poole, the first kid for that summer. I lived at Brian Park. Well, you know, you can't dive into a pool anymore. I survived it somehow. Um, but yeah, Poole's age, and I think where the splat, one of the contradictions in going to splashback construction is clearly cheaper for communities that cannot afford to replace their $6 million pool. But it does come with the concern about the loss of the life skill of, of, uh, of teaching kids how to swim. When we first looked at a splash pad a few years ago, adjoining Mills Pool, that, and rightfully so, was one of the complaints that we heard. So wait a minute, you mean I got to go to Bryan Park now to learn how to swim? So yeah, it, it is a bit of a conundrum. But splash pads also are more inclusive to where you may not know how to swim. You may have a legitimate fear of water. And in, in the, our older pools, it's you get in your three feet, whether you, that's comfortable for you or not. Splash pads give you that aquatic uh, um, experience without the operational costs and allows almost everyone to participate. Ian. I've been in Chicago for years. Millennium Park has a weight built it is unbelievable how popular that is. Mm -hmm. And people come from all over with their, in their little swimsuits mm -hmm. and play in it, and they have benches around. It's, mm -hmm. it's a center of it is. social life. And it's very inclusive. And it's one of the few in fully integrated parts of Chicago's Millennium Park that starts at that. It'll be, and there's a method to our madness and where we put the splash pad is it will be in the hub of activity. If a couple of members of, of the family are doing something in a pavilion event or a gathering or a meeting or a sale, the splash pad can be kind of a relief uh, recess area for the younger folks. Yep. Two questions, one dealing with safety and patrolling of that entire span of, of pathway. And secondly, maybe I missed some of the history. Where does the Monon Railroad fit into the CSX? It, it was the Monon Railroad. Was. That was the main route out of town. Uh, I think one of my bullet points on the historic uh, uh, ledger was the rail station ended passenger service in 67, I think. But that was the Monon Rail Line passenger service. Um, I'm sorry, what was the other part of your question? Dealing with patrolling. safety and, and patrolling. Yes. We have not only volunteers that patrol the B-Line, we have BPD officers on ATVs as well as bicycles. Um, the entire park will be lit. This will be our first park with camera surveillance. We've never, I mean, we don't have that. There might be on a private property across the street from People's Park, a camera that would give you a view of People's Park. But this <laughs> is a property that we are putting up cameras in. And I'm, I struggle with that a bit. I, I'm not from that generation to where you know you accept. I do accept the fact that everybody's on camera all the time, but to put it in and have this kind of overriding surveillance in a park, we're trying to do it in a tasteful, not overkill way. But it does provide a, a measure of safety, and I'm certainly smart enough to know that be, I can put all kinds of bells and whistles and creature comforts and attractions and things in this park, but if you for a moment feel like it's not a safe park for you to be in, I can't get you as a customer. So we're in the day and age where surveillance is part of our daily lives and it'll be part of this park's design. Yeah, Jim. Just want to ask about the park ambassador program, <coughs> which is comprised of volunteers. How significant will that be? Oh, I think it'll be really significant. We're going to need people that Right now, we'll have like the Brian Park ambassador, and they'll help us with monitoring maintenance activities. We will literally have half a dozen ambassadors for this park alone. One might be for the pavilion, one might be for trails, one might be for the athletic courts. They've been just invaluable to us in helping us in areas where oftentimes we're not out to interact with the public while they're using the property or they report a maintenance need. So they've been very much uh, an assist to us that we value. And I think there'll be a lot of them in this park. And there's always been a lot of interest in that program as well. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Dave. Dave, I assume you can stick around for a couple minutes afterwards, answer any additional questions, but uh, I do want to get out of here on time. Uh, please keep in mind, we've got uh, a big part of this as well. We're put, putting a lot of trees from our centennial celebration in the park. Kudos so Mike, Mike Baker led the charge last year, and we're, I don't know exactly how many trees, but... 
Um, uh, and, and I want to get to one of our most fun parts. Uh, we rec regularly recognize our speaker with a contribution to a charitable organization. We're in our third quarter now. We need to draw from the hat. So let's drum roll and see who. This quarter's uh, speaker recognition is going to go to the community kitchen. So we'll be doing that. So we'll make a contribution. All right, and uh, next week we've got Bob Zalsberg coming to talk about his history uh, with the HT, uh, obviously a member of our club as well. And then uh, I, wanna, I wanna leave you with a, a thought for the week that I actually got from our Rotarian magazine. This is January's issue. And I would highly encourage you to check it out because on the front cover it says, what it's like ordinary Rotarians tell their extraordinary tales. Uh, and I kinda just breezed through it and I found them captivating one of which uh, this thought comes from, and it says, there are no extraordinary human beings. There are only common, ordinary human beings like you and me who are able to do extraordinary things if we connect to love and to passion, if we do things that are more important than just ourselves. That came from Gustavo Zerbino. He was one of 16 survivors of the plane crash in the Andes in Uruguay in 1972, which the movie and book Alive are based on. He has been a Rotarian for 23 years. And to hear his account, it's a one page, it's only one page, all of the stories are less than one page, uh, was pretty interesting. So I thought that quote was pretty, pretty powerful and exactly what we do. And I don't know anywhere else in our community where we can come on a weekly basis and hear from people like Dave and get that first-hand knowledge about what a beautiful contribution uh, is going to be made to our community. So I'll leave, we, leave you with that and ask you to join me in reciting the four-way test. Please write. Of the things we think, say, and do, first is the truth, second is the fair, long term, third will it go Great week, everybody.